Welcome everyone to uh, round two, part two of uh, the technical introduction to blockchain um, with Lawrence Kirk of Extrapy.io. Uh, for those of you newcomers, if you're wondering about the first event, there are the slides on our medium and there's also a YouTube recording of Lawrence's um, talk from last night. So just find that on our YouTube channel or our website. Oh. Welcome, Vivian. Welcome, welcome. Um, please ask questions in the chat. Keep keep the chat going as well. So, like, post something cool about yourself, what, what you're up to, what degree you do, where you're from. Last night, we had someone all the way from Brazil. So, you know, just, just to show that this isn't just, you know, within the square mile of Oxford and everyone's obeying their uh, residency requirements to meet their degree. Before I hand over to Lawrence, though, um, Anthony uh, from Enclode Club would uh, like to pass on some information about some exciting events uh, they've got coming up with us. So over to you, Anthony. Thank you very much, Brandon. Let me share my screen. Hi, everyone. I'm Anthony. Uh, I uh, graduated from Oxford a few years ago uh, and uh, help out with some of the stuff with the Blockchain Society. A uh, very quick thing so you can get on to Lawrence's fantastic part two. Uh, we run a, uh, a blockchain hackathon that lasts 10 weeks or so um, that we run with pretty much around the world now. It originally was just six UK universities, one of which was Oxford. Now it runs at about 50 different universities or it's open to 50 different universities uh, and students. Uh, it's a blockchain hackathon. We teach you about blockchain. Uh, we educate you about all the different projects and companies in blockchain. And we set some fantastic challenges for you. Uh, to do and we give out a shit ton if I may pardon my French of cash prizes uh, we give out uh, anywhere between 50 and 100k per hackathon uh, to smart people and the coolest thing is that in our last hackathon uh, that finished in August the winner was from Oxford uh, a postdoc in uh, evolutionary evolutionary biology uh, and raised 800k investment uh, uh, pretty soon after that so not only did he did he or well, they win the the, the hackathon get uh, about £5,000 worth of cash prizes. They also raise investment. Uh, you're allowed to answer a, one of the technical challenge um, to do with blockchain or build your own idea. If you've ever thought about you want to build your own blockchain or your own blockchain application, uh, we will help you do that. Uh, you will be supported by weekly workshops, much like Lawrence's brilliant one tonight, uh, some technical support uh, and one-on-one -on -one support from our team. Um, so, And we have some nice, juicy... Uh, overall prizes on top of the prizes that are available per challenges. It's open to everyone. Um, so if you're not necessarily a student or researcher, um, you still can take part. We allow everyone into the hackathon. Um, and if these names mean anything to you, uh, they are quite big, uh, particularly Avalanche and Polkadot are two of the biggest uh, competitors to Ethereum uh, out there uh, at the moment. Uh, so we in encourage you to Register uh, by the 9th of November. We keep registrations open until mid-December, so you've still got a few weeks to decide if you want to, uh, but uh, you have roughly 10 weeks from the 9th of November to build something uh, and submit something uh, in uh, mid-January uh, or by mid-January. Um, we are a community of university students, researchers, hackers. Uh, we've been doing this for a while. Uh, my background is investing in uh, work for investment fund, investing in projects. Uh, so we use this as ways to find cool stuff to invest in. We also help people get jobs uh, and uh, in general, learn about blockchain and support fantastic uh, societies like Oxford Blockchain. Uh, so guys, if you're interested, uh, go to the website. It's hacked. I'll put it in the in the, the chat, but it's hacked.co.club. Uh, you can register uh, here and it should, if all is working fairly well, take you nicely to a simple registration form. Uh, to register you may register as teams you can register as individuals we'll help you find teams if you don't have or you can take part part as an individual uh, so we've had a lot of entrants from oxford in the past a lot of people doing well and i expect that to remain nice and strong moving forward uh, so yeah i'll answer any questions that are in chat uh, but otherwise i'll hand back to brandon to introduce lawrence thank you anthony yeah, so last night, Lawrence introduced everyone to uh, key concepts such as consensus, building trust, open systems, uh, and programmable blockchains. He's going to delve a bit deeper into those tonight, and uh, I think uh, we'll be able to get our feet wet with a bit of code uh, in the next event. Uh, so get ready for that. No need to worry about 
compilers or downloading uh, development environments. It can all be run from the browser and uh, we'll sort you out uh, with that next week. But uh, over to Lawrence from Xtropy.io, uh, CEO and senior blockchain developer there. So once again, Lawrence, thank you. And uh, over to you. Pleasure. Thanks, thanks uh, Brendan. Thanks, Anthony. And thank you all for, for coming uh, this evening, coming back. Uh, we have plenty of time today, I think, um, so we don't need to rush. So there's plenty of time for questions, so please uh, do ask them as, I, as we're going along. Um, if I don't see them uh, in chat, because it's sometimes difficult for me to see the chat, uh, please shout them out to me. Um, I'm very happy to answer questions as we go along. Okay, so let me just share my screen. Um, No, it's not letting me do what I want to. Okay, let me try something else. Mm, slides. Ah, there we go. Okay. Yep. Awesome, Lawrence. You are live. Great. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I've told you about myself uh, yesterday, um, but there's some. Uh, some details if you want to, to contact me, if you have further questions, yeah, please email me. I'll have a look at our website. Um, we also have our website, All About Education, which I'll give you the link to um, at the end as well. Um, what I'd like to talk about this evening, um, it's all about smart contracts, um, programmable blockchains. Um, so we'll look at, we'll have a little recap of, of what I said yesterday about smart contracts. Um, we'll look at some of the languages um, involved um, that you can use and then we'll concentrate on one language in particular called Solidity and I'll go through um, an example smart contract we can, we can write that together and I can explain uh, all the parts of the, the Solidity language and um, how uh, what makes up a, a smart contract and then I'll put in some um, do's and don'ts for um, for programming uh, smart contracts as well that you need to be aware of. Perhaps we should start with um, if there are any questions from the first session. Um, I didn't answer some but uh, if you have any others I'm happy to to do a quick review now. Okay, no, so, okay. so we'll go on, um, look at smart contracts. So yesterday I, I spoke about the, the development of blockchains and said uh, we had Bitcoin in 2008, 2009. Uh, and then the area uh, was very, uh, didn't really make much progress. We had lots of alt, altcoins and uh, people trying to move uh, what Bitcoin did forward. But the next really big step uh, came in 2014 with um, Ethereum. Um, some people call the, the world computer. And I, I have, um, as I was explaining yesterday, it's, you, you should think of this not as uh, distributing uh, computation to be done uh, amongst different people who are all doing different things, but really a particular computational task that is done by everybody at the same time. Um, and it is, it is, we do this because we want the, the essence of the, the uh, the features of the blockchain, things like transparency and verifiability. Um, so all of the nodes on the Ethereum blockchain uh, run virtual machines and uh, they, they, they're able to run small applications called smart contracts. And whereas with Bitcoin, we're, we're thinking about the movement of value uh, between different people and we're tracking that, that is the state of the, the Bitcoin blockchain. With Ethereum, we're tracking the state of these applications, in particular, the state of these smart contracts. Uh, as I said yesterday, just to recap, smart contract, an Ethereum smart contract is a piece of code running in the Ethereum virtual machine. The environment they run in is highly restricted for, for various reasons. The contract itself uh, has three main parts. It has the code, um, the actual code, the functions that we're going to call. It has some states, so these are variables in the contract um, in your application. And it can also have a balance of ether, which is the, 
the cryptocurrency uh, that, that belongs to the Ethereum blockchain. Um, they're called contracts, but they don't necessarily represent a contract between parties. Um, and as you'll see, we, we write them in higher level languages, such as Solidity, and they're compiled into to bytecode. Uh, and that is that bytecode is what is kept on the blockchain. And the, the process that we go through to create and, and run smart contracts is that, for example, Alice decides she wants to write a contract, so she creates it um, in uh, whatever language she likes and compiles it into bytecode and then submits that as a transaction and to the, into the blockchain. And that, thanks to the peer-to-peer -peer network and the gossip protocol, that contract is gossiped around um, the, the network. Um, of course, it's slightly more complex than that. Initially, it goes out as a transaction. That transaction becomes part of a block, and it is the block itself that is, is passed around the network. But at the end of that process, every node on the network will have a copy of Alice's contract. And then if Bob wants to call a function in the contract, um, he will send a transaction to call a function. That transaction will get passed around the network. Uh, again, it will then get put into a block. The blocks will get passed around the network. And then within that block, the, the transactions will be processed in order by the virtual machine. So every virtual machine on the network will take the, the transactions in the block and go through them one by one, running those transactions, running the functions that those transactions are calling, uh, then passing in the parameters that, have, that Bob chose to pass into the functions uh, and going through those um, until they, they reach the end of the block. And that's the running of those transactions will then update the state of the contract. Um, but because we have determinism, Everybody uh, at the uh, everybody on the network, all those smart contracts will end up in the same state. And it is very important that they all uh, end in the same state after the transaction is applied. Um, okay, one uh, thing that is worth noting, um, an important distinction, is that between types of functions, and we'll see this when we write our contract. But if if you take the example where Bob uh, wants just to read data from the blockchain, then he doesn't need to uh, send in a transaction to, uh, to update the blockchain. Um, his local node that he's using, uh, we, we can assume it is synchronized and will have the data that he wants to read from the contract. And so he can just connect to a node on the blockchain, read the data from that node. So Effectively, he's calling a function which, which will send back data for him. But because he doesn't want to change the state of the blockchain, we do not need to create a transaction that is passed around the blockchain. We can just read it from our local node. Um, we don't need to come to any kind of consensus because we're not making any alterations to the state of the contract. So this is an important distinction that you need to bear in mind when you're, you're writing your contracts and we'll see how Solidity has a special keyword to show this. Okay, now I mentioned there were restrictions uh, on uh, when we're writing our contract. Um, and they, it, when you're coming to something like Solidity from a traditional programming background, you will find that it is much more restricted. You'll find that it is much harder to do things in Solidity and in smart contracts uh, than it would be if you're writing, say, a JavaScript program or a C++ program. The first uh, restriction we have is something called gas, and this uh, relates to the amount of computation that your smart contract will do. Now, if you, the reason for this is to prevent uh, denial of service attacks against the network. If you imagine uh, without this restriction, someone could upload a malicious contract which had an infinite loop in one of the functions and then call that function, and then all of the uh, all of the nodes on the network would all of the virtual machines would then have to do the same thing they would all be running this function which would just carry on forever and so you would effectively stop the network running and so we introduced this idea of gas and what this is is that when you run a function in uh, in ethereum uh, each computational step that you take within that function has a gas cost associated with it 
And when you send in a transaction to call a function, you have to pay up front for the gas that the function is going to use. So you're paying up front for the amount of computation that your function is, is going to use. Um, and you pay for that in Ether, so the, the cryptocurrency for Ethereum. And because you can, you know, this is tradable on exchanges, this has a real world value. And so every time you make a transaction on the Ethereum network, and you, every time you try to use a smart contract, there is a real world cost to this. This is effectively the, the transaction cost that you, you see in Bitcoin, for example. And this fee that you pay up front goes to the miners um, of the blocks. Um, but it is really there to not only reward the miners, but also to prevent denial of service. Now, if when you're running your, your function, if you haven't provided enough gas, your, the, the virtual machine will keep track of the amount of gas you have left as you step through your function, as you do your computation. If that amount that you have left reaches zero, then the virtual machine will stop the function at that point. It will revert all of the changes that you have made. So it will be as if your function never happened. The only thing uh, is that the amount, the gas that you provided will be lost. So that gas will go to the miner. Um, so you will still pay for that. So you should always uh, make sure that when you're starting a transaction to call a function, that you have sufficient gas for that. Uh, then the amount, the, the fee, the, the cost of that um, can vary. And this defines the cost of a transaction on Ethereum. And this varies quite considerably over time. And particularly uh, over the summer, when we had a lot of people uh, using uh, decentralized finance applications, the, the gas cost rose considerably and stick to, the, to the point where it could be uh, you could be paying $20 uh, for a transaction or even more. So uh, you, can, you can find out, uh, there are websites that, that will allow you to track the, the, the gas cost. Um, and it is something when you're developing uh, your smart contracts that you need to bear in mind because your end user will be paying to use your product. And so you want to make sure that they're not being uh, disincentivized from using your, your application by the high cost of transactions. Okay, so that's gas. The, the second uh, restriction we have is determinism. And this, as I said, is because we want the state of our contracts to be the same uh, throughout our network. So every virtual machine, after processing a transaction, has to come to the same state. And what this means is that we cannot uh, do anything on our virtual machine that may be diff but on differently on different virtual machines on different hardware. So for example, you cannot look at the local file system because that will be different on different machines. You cannot go to the internet to get data because some machines may be behind a firewall or may not have uh, the ability to get to various internet sites. Um, you cannot even uh, do floating point arithmetic at the, uh, at the present uh, in Solidity because this can be done uh, implemented differently uh, on different hardware and so there's a possibility that uh, your calculations would end up different. So this does restrict very much the amount uh, how we do uh, write our applications. We do a lot of uh, integer uh, arithmetic uh, in solidity. Um, also uh, random numbers, uh, we can't do random numbers uh, because obviously they will be different on each uh, virtual machine. This is a big drawback to uh, if you're writing a gambling application. Um, there are ways around this, but uh, it just does present a, a problem. It may be that you will use an oracle to get a, a random number from an external source. Or there is, <coughs> excuse me, a contract called <coughs> Randau, uh, which you can use for uh, random numbers. <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so as I said, um, oracles are, are third parties, I trust the third party applications that we use to fetch data for us from external sources. So they will go to an external data source, perhaps uh, something giving you exchange rates, uh, and they will then put those into your smart contract. But they do this as a transaction, and this ensures that every virtual machine on the network 
will get the same data. Um, and to uh, to incentivize them, you, you're obviously going to have to pay them for their, their services. Um, there are a number of different ones around. Oracleize was one of the first ones, but now there is um, you also have Chainlink, who uh, offer oracles and oracle services, um, and Tola. There, there are a number of, of different ones now. Okay, so uh, the environments that in which our smart contracts lives is the Ethereum uh, virtual machine. Um, it's the, the specifications for that are given in the Ethereum yellow paper. It is a simple architecture, I guess. Um, its architecture is perhaps not the best designed. Um, it was written in a way that uh, perhaps is, was done very simply, but uh, certainly doesn't make use of some of the uh, more recent improvements in, uh, in virtual machine design. But it is what it is. Um, there are some, the, the architecture of it does uh, give some uh, restrictions or uh, features to your contract. Uh, for example, it's, everything is based um, on uh, 256 uh, bit uh, words effectively, so everything is done on 256 bit arithmetic. Um, Generally, we don't have to think about that with when you're writing in Solidity. If you do a lower level language you're using assembler, then that becomes more um, pertinent. Um, yeah, you don't need to know much more about that for, for what we'll do today. Um, there's a diagram here of it uh, that someone kindly uh, supplied. Again, this really just shows some different areas. On the, on the very left, you have what is stored on the blockchain. So this is really the estate, state of accounts, the state of our contracts really, and um, obviously the, the blocks. Uh, in the middle there, we have uh, what is happening in the, the Ethereum virtual machine itself, and the process we go through, um, as we're going through a function, we're calling op codes and uh, running uh, computations. Um, and then we have uh, the caller um, of the, the contract as well so they will send in there will be some information about the caller and the transactions there are some uh, available variables uh, that are available to you in your contracts that you can use such as the address of the person that called your contract the uh, the block number uh, the block timestamp um, things like that um, thinking of languages themselves um, yeah this is an incomplete list um, so on Ethereum, uh, the main ones um, are Solidity and Viper. Solidity looks, I guess, like JavaScript. Viper is more like Python, um, but we'll be just looking at Solidity today. If you look at other blockchains, uh, they, they sometimes use traditional languages. Um, so Solidity was written, um, was invented just for Ethereum, um, but other blockchains such as Hyperledger and EOS, uh, they use traditional languages. Um, before you write your smart contract, it is worth um, thinking uh, about the design of the application. Um, and this can be quite, quite a tricky thing to get your head around. So if you're, if you're used to writing applications, you know, for a centralized application, adapting that to a decentralized system uh, can be quite tricky um, and to show you um, an example of that we can think of the game rock paper scissors now to write this as a centralized application is quite simple um, i just done so on the questions uh, yeah rust uh, rust is a yeah a good it is a safe programming language they, they have great memory safety um, it's perhaps quite difficult. It has quite a steep learning curve to use it. Um, I don't know a blockchain that uses it for a smart contract language. Um, the parity uh, uh, client uh, for Ethereum was written in Rust. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't know of any ones that are being used as uh, smart contract languages. Um, yeah, so to go to, to Rock Paper says, if you imagine trying to write this as um, a game uh, on the Ethereum blockchain, what smart contract to do this? Um, if you did it in a very naive way, um, perhaps you would um, have the following thing, the following approach. So you'd have a smart contract that is 
um, keeping track of the game and the track of people's moves and maybe paying out a reward to the, the winner of each round. Um, and you can imagine um, Alice would, uh, pl if she goes first, she would play her move. So, for example, she would send in a transaction uh, with the uh, move rock. So that transaction would go into the smart contract. Um, but the, the obvious drawback to this kind of naive approach is that transactions and their parameters are transparent. Everybody on the blockchain uh, can see uh, all of the transactions and the parameters involved. So if Alice plays this move, then Bob would be able to see uh, the move that she has played. She would be able to see that she, her transaction was the move rock. And so it's trivial for him then to find a winning move against that. So he would, in his transaction, he would submit a paper uh, to the smart contract and therefore he would win. And this is a guaranteed win and the smart contract would, would pay him his prize. But it's a guaranteed win for him. Uh, whoever goes first is really guaranteed to lose in this situation. So we'd have to do something to, uh, to fix this. Um, one way we can do this and, um, is to use something called um, the commit and reveal um, process. And this partially solves our problems um, in that what we can do is we can use hashing functions. So we, we spoke about hash functions yesterday and the smart contract could, instead of taking a plain text input, it would take the hash uh, of the, the move that Alice would want to play. So Alice would play uh, rock, but she would send in the hash of that to the smart contract. Um, and if she did this, Bob may see that uh, what Alice has done, but it's not in plain text, so maybe he doesn't know uh, what she has played. So he then makes his move, so he commits, you know, he plays uh, scissors, so he sends a hash of scissors. And this stage is called the commit stage because we're sending, we're saying what our moves are in advance uh, to the contract um, by sending a hash of that move. And then in the reveal stage, we, we have to uh, repeat the process, but then we send our move in plain text into the contract. And the contract can take these plain text moves that we've made and check those, take the hash of those and check those against the hashes we made in our commit stage, check that they are correct. So check that we haven't cheated and sent in a different move. And if those match up, it can then decide on the winner so I can verify that Alice made a correct move. She made uh, the correct reveal for the commit that she sent in. Um, she could, the smart contract can verify that uh, and then decide um, that she is the winner and send out her prize. Oops, that's uh, right. Um, so that is a, a partial solution to the problem, but it's not a complete solution. Bob could still cheat because he could knowing that there's only three possible moves in this game, he could take the hash of those three alternatives and work out uh, in advance what, the, what Alice is going to, to play or, or potentially what Alice's transactions could be. And when Alice does make a commit and does send this hash, he could work out what her move was going to be. So it's not a, a complete solution uh, for this. You, so these are the, the kind of questions when, you, when you're writing something, when you're writing a smart contract, these are the kind of ideas that you have to, to think about. Um, you, you have to really assume a very adversarial environment um, and that people will try to, to cheat and try to uh, break your contracts. Um, so you have to make sure that you, you write your contract in a way that, uh, that it cannot be broken, that people cannot cheat it or game it in any way. Um, in addition to be able to, to being able to win the game by working out the the moves that they're making, there's also the possibility of um, stopping the game. So if your smart contract is written in such a way that it is waiting for a move, then you could have a situation where Bob could start off the game but then go away and not play the next part, not play his move, and therefore stop the whole game, um, either maliciously or perhaps accidentally, maybe he would lose his connection to the internet. So again, this, this, these kind of questions are ones that you have to think about and solve um, for your smart contract. 
Okay, so um, let's have a look um, at a contract. So I'm going to now share my screen um, and we can go through looking at uh, the Remix um, environment. Stop that. Stop that. And Lawrence, I think we have a question from um, Akanksha. Uh, is it easier if I unmute you, Akanksha, just to ask the question? Hold on. Um, hi, can I ask the question? Sure. Great. Uh, so I really understood the concept. Uh, the pictorial representation was great. Uh, I just wanted to ask, we just had a lecture on this today and uh, we understood that in blockchain technologies, your identity remains anonymous. Mm -hmm. So uh, Bob would never know it was Alice technically, unless like if it's a multiplayer game, he would never know who's, who he is playing against. Is that the case? Like, mm -hmm. that's a, that, that was a contradicting fact that was going on in my head when he mentioned the whole example. So, okay. Yep. That, thank you. That's a, yeah. That's a good point. So, uh, generally, identities uh, on the blockchain uh, are perhaps not what people think they are. So, people tend to think they are, for example, on Bitcoin, Ethereum. People tend to think they are that they as real people are anonymous. It's not quite true. There's a pseudo anonymity. Um, so, your your identity certainly on the Ethereum blockchain is given by your Ethereum address which is derived from uh, your public key. So you create a private public key pair, and that public key is then used to derive your address. And this is used as the, uh, the simplest form of your identity uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. Now, it's, people think that they are anonymous, um, and particularly on, with things like Bitcoin, they think they're making anonymous transactions. That's not necessarily true, and there are companies that, um, work to uh, track things like money laundering on uh, the blockchain um, and do forensics on the, on the Bitcoin blockchain, for example. And they do have some success using very statistical techniques in tracking who um, people are in the real world or, or often identifying where addresses, you know, how in addresses interact with each other and maybe the, which addresses are in fact the same person and then using that kind of information to track down people. So in, in the case of um, our game, yes, Alice and Bob would be represented perhaps by just uh, an Ethereum address, so just a large number. But also maybe in your smart contract, um, you would give the opportunity for people to associate uh, a name with that address. And so to, the, to that extent, they could have some kind of identity. And then also there are companies who are addressing this to give people, to help people put their real world identity onto blockchains and, and to, um, yeah, so um, to, to allow you to have, yeah, to, to have a real world identity uh, on the blockchain and to associate, um, you know, your real world documentation, perhaps your passport, your driving license, use this to prove some identity on the blockchain that, that represents you. So, I hope that answers your question. Um, yes, definitely, that definitely answers my question because now it makes more sense how your identity could be revealed. And eventually, in some applications, you would need anonymity. For example, if you're building uh, the future of a voting application where you need to remain anonymous, but still need to formally verify, that's a complicated process. I yes. mean, maybe in that, that, maybe if you go in that direction, this would really help. But yeah, if you've seen the latest online banking accounts, they just require some ID and then you are done. So definitely, that makes complete sense. Thank you so much for answering. Pleasure. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, that's quite that's quite right. The uh, onboarding process is still one that puts people off from from using blockchain to some extent. It can be uh, quite onerous. Um, yeah. Um, but I think there's going to be developments in in these areas. So it's going to be an interesting time. Okay. So I'll just share my, my browser. So uh, hopefully you can see that. Um, let me find my chat again. Okay. 
Okay, so the environments that we're going to use um, to develop our smart contract, uh, the, the, the tool we're going to use is called Remix. And to use it, you just have to open a browser and go to the address remix.ethereum.org. I just, I'll type that into the chat. It's capitalized it, but I won't. Um, yeah, so you, if you want to code along as I'm, I'm doing this, uh, please feel free. Um, it's a great, this is a great tool to start with because you don't have to uh, uh, download any software for this. You don't have to install anything. Um, there are other tools and uh, next week we'll see some of those, um, but this is a very good, good place to start. It gives you good feedback as well. And um, it's, if you're, when you're learning uh, Solidity, I think it's a, it's a great tool. You can do everything with this if you want to. You can write a smart contract and deploy it to the, the main Ethereum network if you, if you want to. So, but generally I think it's, it's useful when you're initially developing a contract. Um, I'll uh, just check, I've got some notes. I want to make sure of covering everything. Yeah, so the uh, another useful thing, um, which uh, um, another useful tool um, that uh, you may want to use, um, we not going to use it this evening, but uh, it is uh, useful. Is the the MetaMask uh, plugin uh, for your browser? So this is a wallet uh, that you can use. Um, it's a plugin. Looks like this. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see that. I'm not sure if plugins will appear when I share my screen. Um, but it is a, a browser plugin. Um, it works as a wallet, and you can use it to sign transactions. So if you're interacting with the main Ethereum network or some of the test networks, then you can use uh, the MetaMask plugin as a, a means of doing that. But this evening, we won't be doing that. We'll be using uh, just a, an in-memory, an in-browser uh, blockchain uh, that doesn't connect to anything outside the browser. Okay, so we'll start off with a quick tour of Remix. Um, so on, on the very left-hand side, um, we have an area where you can add plugins to to the environment. And there are um, there are two that you will definitely need if you're going to write a smart contract. So there's the two I have here. To add those and to add other ones, you click the plug, and that brings up a list here of all the possible plugins. So I've just installed or activated two. So the top one here, that's the Solidity compiler. So you definitely need that. The second one is the uh, kind of the environment that allows you to run and uh, deploy uh, your contracts. So you need you will need those two definitely. Um, but there are plenty of other ones, some very uh, interesting ones. Some involved around security, or static analysis, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but we will just look at those two uh, this evening. Okay. And then um, this part here, if you click the the little files. This is your file explorer. So when you want to write a contract, uh, a new contract, you can click this little plus sign here, and this will bring you up a new new file. You can give it a name, um, and that will bring up an area in, in the, the large area here on, on the right where you can write the source code for your contract. And then you can go through these. These are all stored in the browser, effectively, but you can store them on your local file system as well. So this is just the source code we're talking about here. We're not interacting with the blockchain yet. This is just the source code. But you can write your contracts and have them here. Um, so you can see I've got some other ones here. Um, I'm going to look at this one uh, this evening. So that's the, the File Explorer. Um, the, if you look at the Solidity compiler, um, you, can, you just click on the icon there and it brings it up here. Um, it is trying to compile my contract um, because I uh, I opened a different contract then moved back to this one. If I close all of those, so it doesn't try to do too much. Um, so this is what you will see when it compiles. It will you will get a green uh, you'll get a green tick uh, from that. Um, and then the 
the other part we have here is a section that you use to deploy and run the transactions. So when we have a when we have a compiled transaction, it will appear here where you see contract, and then we can deploy this to a particular environment. And I'll I will show you how to do that um, when we uh, have a compiled contract. Okay, so we'll go back um, here, go back to our Solidity compiler ready, and we'll start writing a contract. So I've already created a file for this and called it score.sol. The contract that I'm going to write is very simple. Um, it's really trivial and perhaps in the real world not very much use, but it is just to introduce you to the Solidity language. Okay, um, so the really this is the very simplest uh, thing that we can have that is going to compile. So at the very top here, we have this line which uh, defines the version of the compiler, the version of Solidity we're going to use. Excuse me. So what I'm saying here is that we're using Solidity from version 0 0.7 to 0 0.8. Um, so I would just recommend uh, just copying this um, when you when you write your contract, just copy this. Um, this will bring up um, we're, we're, the latest version of the compiler is, is uh, 0.7.4. So this will pick up the latest version of the compiler, the latest version of Solidity, and I'll be fine. Second line down is really a comment. You don't have to include this, but it is it allows you to uh, put in details about the license that your contract will have. So if you're thinking about this is open source, you can put in uh, some metadata here about your contract uh, in the license. If you don't include this, it will give you a warning. So I've just included one there so that you don't get any warnings. Generally speaking, I would say uh, use the compiler and use the warnings. They it really will help you. Um, the compiler definitely is your friend. Um, so it will tell you when you're doing things wrong and it will make suggestions. There may not be the most helpful of suggestions, but you should definitely um, take note of them. If you've got errors, then obviously you won't be able to proceed. But even uh, warnings, um, I would definitely look at them. So I wouldn't hide warnings if you if you get them. Definitely look at the warnings it is coming up with because it may be a good indication that there is a better way to write uh, what you want to do. Okay, so um, we we write our contracts. The next line we have is what uh, is what defines our contract. So we use the keyword contract and then we give it a name. So this is my contract. I'm going to call a contract score because I'm going to use it to keep uh, track of a score. And then we use uh, braces, curly brackets to show the limits of our contract. So we're going to write the code within these braces. And because I've followed the syntax properly here, um, I'm not getting any um, errors showing. If I misspelled the keywords, if I get more to compile, if uh, very responsive. Okay, there you go. If I misspell the keyword or make a syntax error, then the compiler will warn me. Um, I should get a little indication on the line that is wrong, and I'll also get an error message uh, on the bottom left here, giving me some more details. Okay, and it does also suggest um, give you some suggestions as well when you're when you're writing the contract of keywords and variables that it knows about. So it's the, they can also be used to autofill. Okay, so that is just that's the most basic contract you can have. It's a completely empty contract, so it's uh, not a great deal of use. Um, Oops. I'm going to start adding to this now. I'm going to do this. Um, I'm just going to copy and paste um, some um, pieces in um, rather than typing them. It's just a quicker way to do it. Um, but what I'm going to do first of all is introduce um, a variable. So I'm going to introduce some state into our contract. Um, and this. This state is preserved. Um, okay, uh, yes, I can copy it into the chat as well. Um, perhaps what I'll do is um, give you the contract at the end, or perhaps part way through rather than doing it line by line. Maybe 
Oh, no, fact, do it like that, Mike. Here we go. So I'll copy that. There you go. So this is the uh, this this is a variable in our contract, and this is some state in our contract, and this is preserved between function calls. So if you set this score to be a certain value, then that score will be preserved in the blockchain until it is changed by somebody uh, calling a function to change it. Now it's an important thing to note that Solidity is a typed language. So when you declare a variable, you have to declare the type of the variable as well. And this first word here is the type of our score variable. So to decode that, what it means is it's a, an unsigned integer and it's size 256, which is the, the maximum size. So this is as large a number um, as we could want. It, it, we could e certainly use a smaller number, but just for uh, convenience, I'm going to use this type. If you miss out the 256 um, and just say uint, it will still work, but it will default to 256. Um, but you can have different sizes. You can have uh, uint8, etc., or anything up to 256. Okay. So that's uh, a variable. Uh, so now our contract um, has some state. Um, so we're, we're adding to it, but it's still not very useful. Um, we cannot easily read this. We cannot write to it at the moment. So it's not much use. Um, so the next thing we probably want to do is to be able to read the state from the contract. Um, so to do that, what I'm going to do is to add a function to, to read the value of the score. So let me just get that. So here's, here's my function. So this is the function that Uh, somebody could call to find out the value of score in our contract. So we start off a function with the function's keyword. We then have the name of the function. That can be anything you like. We then have a space within the parentheses for any parameters. For this one, we don't have any, any parameters, so we don't have anything in there. We then have some keywords, which I'll, I'll explain in a moment. Um, and uh, then within the curly brackets, we have the actual code that we're going to run. So what this function is going to do is it's going to return the value that we have in our score variable. Now, as I uh, mentioned earlier, um, it's an important distinction to make between functions that just read some value from the blockchain and functions that try to change the value on the blockchain. And so that is why we have this view keyword here. So what this keyword is doing is saying that this effectively is a, a read-only function. So if we took away the view keyword, that would mean that uh, this function could be used to write uh, a value uh, to our contract. And you'll see when I take it out, the compiler has realized that even though we've said this is a potentially a write function, that we're not actually doing any writing. So it's suggesting to us that we make it a view function. So that's what we'll do. Okay. And then the next keyword is uh, one that you will need for every function. And this shows the visibility of the function. And if we remove this, uh, we get an error. So we, we have to have that. Um, this, it doesn't just give us a warning, it will give us an error. So every function we have will need a keyword to show the visibility. And the visibility for this one, whoops, I've said is public. The choices we have um, are um, public or private and internal and external. And of these, public is the most permissive. It really means that our function can be seen from anywhere. It can be seen um, from uh, the, within the contract, it can from, be seen from outside of the contract, it can be seen from uh, derived contracts, um, as we shall see. Um, it really is the, the most permissive, this, this thing. Anybody uh, can potentially uh, see this contract. Um, we could, uh, an alternative to this one, that the most common one I think you would use um, would be something like external. Um, this means that this function can only be called 
from outside of our contract. So, for example, if you have a, a web page that is making a call into your smart contract um, to read this value, this external keyword would allow that. But it would mean that another function within the contract could not call this function because this is purely external. And it's, it's very useful, it's a good design principle to, to be labeling your functions um, as internal and external as much as you can, just so that you then get a good idea um, of the, the interface that your contract presents to the world. So if you have your external functions um, together, you will have a good idea of what an outsider um, can, how an outsider can interact with your contract. Um, but I'm going to make that put that back to public um, for the moment. And then the next uh, keyword we have, this returns, shows us the return value from our function. So because we want to return our score, and that is of type uint256, then we need the keyword returns, and we need to say what type, what the data type is uh, for that return. Okay. It is possible also to put a, uh, a variable name in here, so you could have uh, something like this, and if you want, uh, but it's not needed, um, you can just uh, have the data type. Okay, and um, as someone said in uh, uh, chats, uh, chat, yes, you can, for comments, yeah, you can uh, use uh, slash like this to, to make comments um, as you're going along as well. Okay, so that's the very simplest function really that we can have, but this means that now our contract can actually read the score um, we can read this some state of the contract uh, from it. So it is usable to some extent, even though we can't actually change the score. So if we deployed the contract, this score would get an initial a default value of zero. So everybody that called the get score function would end up getting back a value of zero. So it, it works, but it's not very useful. Okay, um, maybe a good point for us to take a break. I know that um, people ask to. Uh, have a quick break in the, in the middle of this uh, talk this evening. So uh, I think that's probably a good point to do that. Um, if we take um, just over five minutes, so if we come back at 18.35, uh, um, just to give people a chance to have a break, and then we'll look at uh, other types of functions and, and other types of variables in Solidity. Um, or if you have any questions you want to ask in the time as well, um, please do. Uh, yeah, the compiler, uh, yes, yeah, so it, it picks up a compiler. So there are, as, as you can see at the top here, there are various compilers available that it can uh, install. So if you wanted, you can go back to a very early compiler. Um, but yeah, so you can choose choose the one you want. Um, but it's all there within the browser. Yeah, it's not relying on any uh, external compiler to be uh, installed. Yeah.
So to answer the uh, Bashir's question, so um, you say we selected the 0.7 compiler, or can we select what we wish? Uh, yes. So uh, on the left here, you can select the compiler that you would like to use uh, when, the, when you're compiling your contract. The statement at the top that I have saying 0.7 means use any compiler from 0.7 to 0.8. Um, so it will, uh, yeah, we'll be happy to use 0.7.4, um, but we could choose a different one. Um, if we chose uh, 0.6, for example, it's probably going to give us a problem. Um, so it's not happy. Oh, no. Oh, it's gone back to 7.4. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Generally speaking, you just leave that to be the latest, the latest version. Um, there are some language differences between the major versions. So, if you had something very specific, then you might want to go back to an older version, but generally not. Uh, so the question how how long the session will be so we'll uh, we have almost another hour to go yeah so I'll finish at uh, seven thirty Okay, so we'll continue now. Uh, one thing I, I should mention, um, the documentation for Solidity is quite uh, comprehensive. It's uh, quite well written. Um, if you uh, go to uh, solidity.readthedocs.io, let's place that in, then you get the, the documentation. Uh, it's well worth using that. So you, you'll probably want to use that when you're writing Solidity to find out the, the exact details um, uh, of, what you, of what you're doing. Um, there was a question. Uh, date. Uh, so how is the date coming to a variable? So dates are a little tricky because the, the concept of time on the blockchain is something that's rather nuanced. So the if you're uh, if you want to get the time that your function is running uh, then you should you can get something called the block timestamp so this this gives you a time that the when the block was produced so uh, when when your function is running and that was uh, as part of the block the only problem with that is that this time is uh, input by the miner of the block and is not and necessarily very accurate. I mean, it's accurate to some extent, to um, I guess a few seconds perhaps, um, but it may not be more that. Um, it does have a, a margin of error uh, at which the block would be rejected, but it is done by a, via the miner. So it's not something that you can necessarily rely on. Uh, so often people, rather than using the block timestamp, may use the block number if they are trying to show the maybe the order of some event um, and then dates um, yes you can use there are some libraries um, 
available. So people have written other smart contracts that your contract can call. And some of those have uh, functions for handling dates and doing date and time manipulation. But yeah, so bear in mind the caveat that the date, the time might not be exact. Um, okay, so, um, okay, so we have a question about the differences in designing centralized and decentralized apps from the point of view of a developer. So yes, that's, that's a very good point. And um, it's, uh, there's quite a number of differences, I guess. So uh, if you have a centralized application, then you are in control of that application. You can easily modify uh, what that application is doing. Um, and it's the, you can easily restrict the, the people who are accessing your application. So decentralized applications are in a much more hostile environment. And once you have written your smart contract and deployed it, um, it is out there and you cannot change it. Uh, the contract itself is immutable. You cannot change the code that you have written. So you have to be very careful that the code is doing exactly what you want it to do. Um, the other things to bear in mind are that um, the, your code, the smart contract code can be called by multiple unknown people. You won't necessarily know who they are. And I'll come on to uh, that in a moment in how we write our, our contract. Um, but it, it, by default, uh, certainly by, for example, the way I've written this function, anybody in the world could call this function um, and you don't necessarily know anything uh, about that person. So you have to be very careful about, uh, about that when, you, when you're watching decentralized apps. Um, there is also the case um, that you, the, the way the application runs is the is via transactions. The order of those transactions cannot be guaranteed. Uh, they are chosen by the miner. So you should not make any assumptions about that either. Um, I think the, the best example is, is perhaps the one I gave with rock, paper, scissors um, to show you how different it is to write a decentralized application. If you didn't that in as a centralized application, it would have been much easier to write. You could have, um, much more easily controlled the behavior of the, the participants in the, the application. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for your answer there. Uh, but I just wanted to ask one more thing. Uh, this assumes that the code is always correct, which it almost never is in real life because it always has bugs. Uh, for example, the case study we did today was the DAO's uh, code base, which was hacked. And then uh, about $50 million were taken away in ethereum to yes uh, yeah the, the, that's the whole situation that's how it happened so even though with a, a lot of people a lot of community building up apps like this with so much security uh it is possible that they can be hacked right well uh so the, the i think the example you you're talking about is the, the dao um the, the attack on the dao um yes so certainly you can have bugs within your smart contract so that your contract may act differently to how you intended but so there is that kind of attack that can be done. Um, so someone can manipulate um, and call your contract in a way that is to their advantage and against the intention that you had when you wrote the contract. Uh, but the code itself cannot be altered. So from, to that extent, it can't be hacked. So traditional hacking may involve changing the code that somebody's calling so that they're actually running a different piece of code to what they're expecting. So from that point of view, you can't do that. And that is one of the advantages of smart contracts. Um, and because they're on a blockchain, you, you can always be sure what code it is that you're running. But in the, the, the hacks that have happened um, are all down to people having bugs within their code. So it's not the, it's not an attack at the protocol level in any way. It's not that there's any problem with Ethereum. Um, it is the fact that they, what they wrote uh, had bugs and didn't behave as they expected and led to uh, an undesirable result. Yeah, so one, for example, someone being able to withdraw a great deal of money from the contract, um, which is what, not what they wanted, but that was just because they didn't foresee how the contract would be used. Yeah. Um, I will talk a little bit more about security a little bit later on. 
Um, but I'll, I'll continue now about um, the, the functions. So we've written a function to, um, to get the score from our contract, but that's not so useful, that's useful, but we need something also to change the score. Um, so I'll add a function in here to, to change the score as well. Put that into, um, Okay, I've got an extra. Yeah. Uh, good error. Uh, okay, uh, that's fine. Um, I've got a little bit more in my function than I intended. Okay, so yeah, this is the basic, um, the basic one. Um, so this function takes in. Um, this is what we want to use to set, to change the variable score. So this is a function that is going to be called as a transaction. And it's going to change the state of the blockchain. It's going to specifically change the value, our value score. Um, and so it's quite straightforward in how it works. So we pass a parameter um, underscore score here, uh, which is then set to be our value score. Um, and I've, again, I've declared it as a public function. We can uh, return a value from this, although we don't have to. Um, and I should point out that, and we'll perhaps see more of this on next week, that even though we return a value from our function, um, it is not uh, easily seen um, by, uh, it's certainly not seen within the contract and it is more difficult to see what this function does. So from an external point of view, if we call this function to set the score, that, that calling uh, application would not see the result of this function because um, all it's, what that calling application would create a transaction to, to call this function uh, and all it would get back immediately is a hash the transaction, the, the idea of the transaction. Because uh, if you think there's quite a disconnect, so that transaction has to be created, sent off to the blockchain, it has to be mined, put into a block, uh, and then the block has to be passed around. So it could be you know, 15 to 20 seconds after the transaction is created before this function actually runs. So even though somebody is calling this ex from an external process, they wouldn't see this return value. Um, it would be seen if you call this from an internal function, from a function that's inside the contract, but not if it's done from an external, uh, an external an application. And we'll see how you get around those in a minute. But this, anyway, this gives our, our function a bit more uh, usability um, and allows us to, to set the score and then to get it uh, afterwards as well. Um, but the, the drawback that we have now, um, as I mentioned, is that uh, they, we're not, we don't really know who is calling these functions. And it may be the case that we don't want just anybody to be able to, to call the function, this function and to be able to change the score. And for that reason, we use something called modifiers. So we're effectively changing uh, the permissions around who can call this function. And again, I'll just post uh, oh, I didn't post that function. Let me post that to chat. Um, and then we want a uh, what's called a modifier. So this is something we declare outside uh, our functions. Uh, it's, it belongs to the contract as a whole. Um, and it is a means of restricting who can call a particular function. And the way to think about modifiers is to think that they wrap around a function. So I'm, what I'm going to do is to use this modifier on my set score function. And I do this by adding the name of the modifier here. So what I'm doing is I'm saying this function is now modified, it is restricted um, by this modifier. So the way it works is that when somebody tries to call this function, before they actually get into the function, they have to go through this modifier code. And this modifier code we're going to use to check who is allowed to call a function and to make sure it is people that we want it to be. 
Now we, we've got um, an error here because I haven't declared all the variables that I want. But what this modifier is doing, and I've written this in, in a way that really sh uh, shows what the modifier is doing. There are simpler ways to write this, but I wanted to show it in, in more detail. What this is doing is it's comparing um, this message sender variable with an owner variable. And the when I said it wraps around the function, you can think of the function as being put where we have this underscore. So we have this if statement, which is saying, is this message sender the same as the owner? So the I'm saying there's going to be an owner of this contract. This is an identity. This is someone who has particular rights in, in this contract, has special rights, the, and has rights to change the score. And what we're doing is we're comparing that uh, the, the identity, uh, the owner identity, with this value message.sender. And this message.sender is a value that is provided for you uh, when your contract runs, and it is the Ethereum address of the direct caller of the function. So when someone tries to call this function, their address will go into message.sender, which will be compared here to a special address that we have, who is the owner of the contract. If those match, then we allow them to run this function, so we allow them to set the score. If it doesn't match, then we skip over the function and they don't uh, they don't change they don't change the score now it's objecting here because i have this owner variable that i haven't declared so i'm going to add this here um, and this is um, an address sorry a type address and we'll call it owner. so this this address represents a a special person, a special identity in Ethereum that we're going to set up that uh, has special permissions um, for this, this contract. Um, and um, as the, the, we have the warning here um, that we haven't, that we're not returning, uh, that we don't really need to return a value. So perhaps for simplicity, um, I'll, remove, I'll remove this. Okay. So this now uh, puts, gives some security around our set score function, so only a particular person can, can do that. But then we face the problem that we have this owner address, but we have no way of setting it up. Um, and we want to be able to, to do that, so it's a special, special person. But then we have kind of a chicken and egg situation in that um, we want to be able to, to change that variable, but obviously we want to have some permissions about how that is done. And the, the way to get around this in a very standard pattern within uh, Solidity is to um, use what's called a, um, a constructor. Um, um, okay, which I haven't got something right. So we use a keyword constructor um, and then uh, What we're going to do is to use this constructor to initially set our owner. Now, the, the reason I say this is to initially set our owner is because the constructor is a very special function that is called only when the contract is deployed. And in fact, it's not actually included in the bytecode that uh, is on the blockchain because it's never going to be called again, so it would be a waste of space. So this function is called in the deployment of your contract, so as the contract is being added to the blockchain, but it is never used after that. So as our contract is deployed, we are going to take the value of the person who issued that transaction and make that to be the owner. So our, our special identity is going to be the person who deployed the contract. It's quite a neat way, neat way to do it. I'll just copy that into the chat. So that's the way of setting up our, our owner initially. Okay. Um, I've got plenty of time. So, um, so that takes care of uh, yeah, setting up our owner, 
allowing our functions to be restricted in, in who can call them. Um, but there are other things that we uh, want to do. Um, Uh, so uh, we have a question. It's a modifier circular with the constructor. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, I mean by that exactly, but the, the constructor and the modifiers are separate. You can have multiple modifiers. Uh, they are quite separate to the constructor. So we're not, um, we're not modifying the constructor in any way here. We're not making any uh, restrictions on the constructor here. Um, so the the person who's going to be initially set as the owner will be the person who deploys the contract, which is a, a reasonable assumption. The person who de developed the contract, who deploys it, uh, should have special functions. In a, in a real world example, we would also then have extra code so that we could change this value of owner and set it to be other people. Um, and then we would have modifiers on the function that allowed us to do that, for example. Okay, so the thing I want to uh, look at next is uh, the concept of events. Uh, so let me just copy one of those. Mm, yeah. Now, as I said, when you have a, uh, a function that is making a change to the contract, this is, needs a transaction to do it, but we don't see the result of this. So. Although this is a very simple function here, if you imagine the function was more complex, we may not know, the, the calling application would want to know what happened in that function um, and may want to have a return result, but it is not something we can easily get back into a, a, an external application. And for that, we use uh, things called events. And the way to think about events is really as if they are uh, logging, um, doing a log statement um, from your contract. Um, excuse me. So I'm going to use this event to signal that uh, someone has changed the score and what the score has been changed to. So I've created this event here. Um, I've defined it. Um, so we need the keyword event. It needs a name. And then it, it takes some parameters. We can put, um, you don't need to name these parameters. In fact, let me take that for a moment. You can just put the type of, the data type in there. Or you can name them if you want. And you can also, as you saw then, um, have them uh, indexed. Um, this is just for optimization when uh, you're looking at them externally. But uh, the event um, we're going to use to show that our set score function has been called and that uh, it has run successfully and that the score has changed. And so to emit this event, to log this detail to the blockchain, we use the emit keyword uh, followed by uh, the name of the event and then the value. So we're going to pass in a uint256 here. So we're going to pass in the value of our score here. So this now gives us a means of when we've called our set score function, it gives us a means uh, of uh, signaling to the world what has happened within our function. And external applications can monitor these events and react to these events. It's important to understand that other functions within the contract cannot see this event. So you cannot use it internally within your contract. Um, you, would, you would use other means to do that. You would call other functions directly uh, from this function if you wanted to do that. Um, but yeah, this is used to signal externally that something has happened. So an external application could respond to this event. So I just want to now add um, a couple more uh, data types just to introduce them to you. So we've already seen uh, a numeric data type, UINT256. We've seen an address. This is the, an Ethereum address, um, an identity on the application. Uh, other useful ones uh, that you will need. Um, you can have strings, um, so something like that. Um, so that is what is understood 
uh, by string in other, other languages, just a set of bytes that are interpreted as a set uh, a sequence of characters. Um, and then in terms of com more complex structures, we can also have uh, arrays and mappings. And you will, you will use these a great deal. I'm going to have just uh, paste these in to show you what they look like. So to take the array, first of all, um, if it's not very clear, this got two square brackets there. Um, so what we're saying is we're, we're setting up an ar array of addresses. So this is what is understood by array in, in all other languages. It's just a number of um, addresses um, in sequence and we give it a name. So I'm going to call this one leaderboard, for example. So very straightforward, very similar to what you see in other languages. Uh, something a little bit different is a mapping. This is uh, what people may have come across as dictionaries in Python or uh, hash maps in other languages. And it represents a relationship between two different data types. So we're saying we're going to have a relationship between an address and a number, a UN256. And this is a way that we can associate uh, a score with a particular address. So within our mapping, we could have a great many different addresses uh, of different users uh, who are using our application. And each one of those would have a score which is given by this uint256 number. And this mapping as a whole is given a name which I called score for user. These, these two uh, structures are very uh, common and, and you'll use these a great deal. They're a way of uh, using simple data types. Um, the other one uh, that you will come across that you uh, need to see um, oops, is a struct. Again, if you've uh, coded in um, traditional languages, you will probably have come across uh, the idea of a struct. This is just of putting simple data types together into a larger and creating a lot of type out of it. Um, I'm getting warnings that my my broadband is a little unstable, so if I cut out, uh, please let me know if the video uh, stops being, um, I'll get my, I'll get a hot spot ready in case it, it does fall over. Okay. So really those, uh, the, those things I've shared, they are the, the, the simplest, the most important parts perhaps of a contract. So at the top here we have skills, we have here um, some variables, some data types put together into a user defined data types. Okay, sorry about this. Um, I'll repeat that. So we have some variables. We have some data types here that are collected into a user-defined data type. We have some we have some collections of variables here, um, either as maps or as an array. We have a modifier. So from this point up, these are fairly traditional. I guess you'd have seen these in any other languages. Modifiers and events are very specific to the Ethereum blockchain. Um, but yeah, this modifier we use for security really to restrict who can call our functions. We have events that uh, allow us to ref to allow us to log uh, things that have happened in our function calls. Um, and then we have a constructor. So this is a function that is run just once. And then we have a number of functions of our contract where we're doing the real nitty gritty of what we want our contract to do. So that uh, really is the perhaps the simplest uh, contract with most of the uh, items that you would you would want to use. Um, I can point you at um, I've written other tutorials and have other videos that will go through and give you more details about this if you want to look into it further. But um, please yeah, have a look. Try this out in Remix. Um, if you make a mistake um, with the syntax, you will get uh, errors shown by the compiler. Um, but once it's happy. Um, you'll get a green tick um, and then you will be able to then deploy it. Ah, oh, good, Mike. I'm glad to see. Uh, 
This sounds better. Good. Um, once you've got your, once you're compiled, you can deploy your contract. So here we, we have my contract is compiled because I can see it here and I get a green tick from the compiler. So I can deploy it. Now I have a choice of where I'm going to deploy it. And this is given by the box at the top here. So we have a choice of three. The one that you should use initially, the easiest one, is the JavaScript VM. So this is a little blockchain that just runs within your browser, just runs within memory. It's very fast. Um, it is, does not uh, connect with anything else. It has its own ether and it gives you some accounts with ether, but this is just fake ether. It, does, it has no real value. But it's very useful when you're first deploying a contract and first testing your contract. The other options, um, Web3 provide the bottom option. Um, you can choose that. Um, if you choose that, it will ask you for a external node. So this is asking you for the address of a node on the, the blockchain that you want to connect to. So if you wanted to connect to, say, the Ethereum mainnet or a test network, and you knew the IP address of a node, you could put that in here and then use this Web3 provider to connect to that. The other option, Injected Web3, um, uses uh, a plugin such as MetaMask. I don't know if you can see that. I don't know if that pops up um, on, uh, on your screen. But if you have a, a, a MetaMask plugin in your browser, it, that will be used to then connect into the blockchain. So you will choose the blockchain that you want from MetaMask. Such You may choose the main network or a test network and then you can choose the injected web three option here to connect through MetaMask to the, um, through the, uh, through to your blockchain. So you've got a question about an error. Let me just have a look at that. Okay. Okay, so, Older versions of Solidity um, required you to put a, a visibility modifier on the constructor. Um, it's only in recent versions that you don't need to do that. Um, it was a strange thing to do. It felt an odd thing because you would want your constructor to be visible because you want to be able to deploy your contract. So, um, yeah, if you use a, a later version of Solidity, that should disappear. Or you can just put a, a public keyword uh, after the parentheses and that should fix it. Okay, so um, just to go back to our, our deployment. Um, so I've got my compiled contract. Um, I've got my chosen my environment. I just want to deploy it to allow my in-memory blockchain. Um, I could choose an account. This is going to be deployed by. Um, all these accounts have a balance of ether, which we need to we need to pay for the gas for our deployment. Um, but it's, as I said, it's fake ether. Um, so I'll just choose the, the default, the top account. Um, you don't need to alter these, these values. Don't put anything here into this value field at this point. If you put something there, what that means is that as well as creating a transaction and sending that off to the blockchain, you're also sending some ether um, along with your transaction, which we, we don't want to do in, in this case. So we're just going to do a deployment. So all I do is click the deploy button and the area at the bottom here, if I can just expand that. Um, oops. This, uh, let me just clear that as well. Um, this will give you the results of what's happening um, when you try to uh, do the deployment. Um, uh, the question, uh, fake ether as in Robston. No, th this, this ether just exists in my browser. Um, the Robston ether is, is separate again. It's, it's, um, but it is just as valueless. Um, it's harder to get hold of Robston Ether, whereas this Ether is, um, sorry, this Ether you have here will be replenished every time you, uh, you open up your browser. But it is just as fake, just as worthless. Okay, so I'll deploy my contract um, and uh, it deploys very quickly. You see immediately we get a green tick and a, a, a message down here to say what has happened. If you were deploying this on a real blockchain, you would, you would have to wait. It would be maybe 15 seconds before you got back a result to say that your contract had deployed. If you want to see more details, uh, you can click the down arrow here 
and it gives you more details of what has happened with your transaction. So it tells you about the, the gas that is used, for example. It shows you the transaction hash, the, the ID of the transaction. And this part here, the logs uh, column, or sorry, the logs row, shows you any events that happened uh, in your transaction. So if we're running a if we're running a transaction calling a function that has events um, and events are emitted uh, in that function we would see those events being printed out here so it's worthwhile uh, remembering that okay but that has uh, deployed my transaction uh, to my little in uh, browser network uh, and it comes up here it shows me that it has been deployed it shows me the address that it was deployed at um, which says it's in memory and we can use this area here to interact with my uh, with my contract. Um, yeah, I'll copy the whole thing here. Oops. Okay. There you go. So we can use this area here to interact with my contract. You will see different colored buttons. The bluey gray button is calling functions that are view functions. So these are functions that just read state. The orange buttons are functions that set state, so that change the state of our contract. So if we call uh, get score function, uh, you can see it comes back with a value zero. It tells us the data type as well and comes back with a zero. And this is because this is just the default value because we haven't set it yet. If I then uh, set the value, and I set it to be 13, um, we see that the, the contract runs and we get a, a tick. Um, and so that should have run our set score function. And if we look in here, we can see the event that was emitted. So we have an, um, an event in our logs area, which includes the, the new score. You see here 13 amongst a lot of other detail. And then if I call my get score function again to read from the contract, you'll see that the, the score variable has now been updated to 13. So you can see that that is this, this contract that is, that is running, or you can see this, those functions that are running. So that, if you're using Remix, this workflow is what you will be doing most of the time. You'll be writing your contract, making sure it compiles, deploying it, probably to your in-memory, in-browser blockchain, uh, and then interacting it with it via the buttons that you have at the, the bottom left. Okay. So that's, I think, a good, uh, great deal of information about Solidity, um, probably as much as you'd want to take in um, all at once. So I'll, I'll finish the Solidity part there, but please, if you have questions, do, do ask them. I have a, uh, a question, Lawrence. Yeah. I was um, wondering, essentially, like, if one were to want to launch their own token on the Ethereum network, yeah. um, how, how much work would they need to do that in terms of code? Or is there code out there they can just pinch? Yes, there is. Um, in fact, I'll come on to that in a second. I don't know if I do. I have a yeah. I don't have an example here in Remix, but I can show you. It's actually it's trivially easy to create a token. It really is very easy. And in fact, yeah, I'll show you the code that you need to do that. Um, and I think the the easy the ease of which um, you can do this was one of the reasons we had the ICO boom back in 2017 because it was just so simple to do. And now there are libraries available that will do all of it for you um, that yeah anybody can can set up a token of their own and put that on the ethereum blockchain and have uh, and make it available so yeah it's trivially easy okay so i'll go back to uh the slides um, uh, 
Okay. Uh, actually, let me. Uh, I'll just. I'll just skip forward a couple because I have exactly that uh, 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 slide for that uh, question. So this is uh, the standard interface for tokens uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. It's called an ERC20 token. Um, so this was a standard that was set up um, which defined the functions that are, would be in a smart contract that define a token. And because it was a, an accepted standard, it meant that exchanges and wallets and other smart contracts would know how to interact with it. Um, so it really makes it you know, as simple as possible uh, to get your, your token adopted. And the, the functions that you need, um, very simple. So we have uh, really the, the top three are the, the simplest ones. The first one, total supply, just says how many tokens are available uh, in total in your contract. So maybe you will launch your token and decide that there will be 10 million tokens available um, initially, and whether the supply will change or not is, uh, is up to you. But initially, that is the, what you would get if you call the total supply function. Balance of is the function that you call to get uh, a user's balance. So if a particular wallet, a particular user has a balance of these tokens, they call balance of and that will return the amount they have. Transfer is the function that you call to transfer tokens between uh, different addresses. So if you want to send some tokens to somebody else, you will call that one. Um, the next three functions are really used for in decentralized exchanges. Um, because decentralized exchanges want the ability to move tokens on your behalf, we have the transfer from function, the one at the bottom. And this allows an exchange to move uh, some of your tokens from your account to somebody else's account. But obviously you need security around that. And so the, the approve function has to be called first. So you would approve a decentralized exchange to spend tokens on your behalf, and then they could they could then call the transfer from function to do that. And if they want to check or you want to check how many tokens you have approved, you can call the allowance function to do that. And the, the two events you see there um, are the events that we need to, to indicate what's going on in our contract. So these are called when tokens are transferred, you get the transfer event saying, you know, whether who sent tokens to whom and how many were sent. And then the approval event is sent if you're showing uh, that you've made some an approval. Okay, so that, uh, that's the actual the interface, that's the standard contract. In fact, this is all written uh, in a library. So there's a project called Open Zeppelin who have libraries and they do all of this for you. If you want to write a contract that does it, you don't even have to implement all of these yourself. You can just inherit from this library effectively include this library in your code um, and maybe just have a constructor function in your contract which says how many tokens you want to be you want to mint how many tokens you want in your uh, initial supply and that's all you need to do so really it's you know one line of code to, to create your own uh, token contract so very easy indeed um, Okay, uh, I was just going to say a couple of things about best practices. Um, so please do use libraries such as Open Zeppelin. So these are open source libraries written by some very clever people. They have been audited. They've had a lot of eyes on them. Um, so please use those as much as you can. It saves you having to uh, reinvent the wheel. Uh, they, and they've got libraries for all of the common things that you want to do. And in fact, the example I had in my contract of setting up the owner and of checking who the owner is, all of that is done by Open Zeppelin. I, I did that to show you the concept, but you don't need to do that. You can get Open Zeppelin uh, to do that for you. Please, um, if you're doing this um, and any there's any kind of money involved or any kind of value in your contract or even just reputational value please get your code audited it's so easy to make a mistake or miss something uh, that uh, could cause big problems down the line and there are so many examples um, of where uh, security has gone wrong where contracts have gone wrong um, we had uh, 
Uh, someone quoted the example earlier on um, of $50 million being lost. That was a simple example of uh, some statements in a contract that were in the, in the wrong order uh, yeah, and meant that you know, millions of dollars were lost. So please get some other people to look at your code, get it audited. There are you know, the companies that do that. I mean, we do this. Um, there are other companies that do this. There are plenty of resources if you want to do this, but it's probably best to have someone else look at your code because they won't have the same preconceptions that you do. They're more likely to spot any mistakes you've made. But yeah, please do that. Um, and assume that the, you know, the environment you're deploying to is full of malicious hackers who are going to do their best to, uh, to steal your crypto in your contract or to break your contract in some way. A good thing to do is to have some kind of escape hatch in your contract. This goes against the principle of autonomy or decentralization a little bit, but it may be you could have a special user, an admin user, who has a means of pausing your contract or changing, you know, uh, reverting transactions to some extent, um, or fixing problems. It's it's very useful to do that. Certainly initially, um, just in case it's something you haven't thought of, you could stop your contract, give yourself time to look at it, see what's going on, um, and perhaps you would re, uh, get rid of this functionality after a year um, when you can be more sure that uh, your contract. Uh, is working properly and something that tends to be a big problem with uh, in blockchain applications generally is the ui so uh, they please write a user-friendly ui something that is intuitive and easy for people to use uh, this is an area that we've really failed to do over the years we've written for the developers have really written for themselves and other people who already understand crypto and understand smart contracts but for People who have not come across these before, um, yeah, please write a user-friendly uh, UI. Don't, uh, don't assume your data is private. If you're talking about Ethereum, nothing that you put in a smart contract or in a transaction going to a smart contract is private. Every piece of data that goes onto the Ethereum blockchain can be seen uh, by someone who wants to see it. So be careful about that. If that, that brings on to the next point, about personal data, um, GDPR restrictions um, make it uh, problematic if you put personal data onto the blockchain. The best thing is just to avoid getting personal data anywhere near the blockchain. Uh, people have a right to be forgotten. Once you've put data onto the blockchain, you cannot effectively delete it because there will always be that transaction on the blockchain that puts it there. So that then goes against people's rights to be forgotten. So be very careful about personal data. Um, yeah, don't assume that a particular user is online when your uh, transaction is running. Uh, maybe that for whatever reason, they're, they're not there. They may be deliberately offline. They, yeah, they may have problems, whatever, but they, they don't, don't assume that. Um, and neither assume that a particular order of transactions will be followed. It is up to the miner to decide which transactions are included in a block and what order those transactions go in. Um, there's a whole topic, a uh, very interesting area about front running that uh, I don't have time to go into now, um, but you also need to be careful that people can put transactions in front of your transaction as well. So do be careful about that. Um, and that does happen and it's, it's causing a problem in uh, decentralized finance applications. Um, there's a great place, once you've started um, writing applications, um, consensus have a good site of best practices. I won't go through those because you really do need to have more uh, information about Solidity to understand a lot of these, but have a look at that, uh, at that link and, and follow their, their best practices. There's a lot of good advice there. Um, we've covered ERC20 tokens. Um, next week, we will look at how you interact with your contract. So what I have covered so far is very much um, uh, about writing the contract and very much focused on that environment and the contract within the EVM. I haven't really said much about how you can interact with that. I've mentioned that we would interact with it and, you know, and this is where external functions are called, but I haven't uh, said how to do that. There are libraries um, that's, that will allow you to do that in a number of languages. The most 
popular one. Uh, I guess it's um, a JavaScript library called Web3.js, but there are other ones. I'm sorry, there's a typo in the, in the uh, slide here. So there are other ones in Java, in Rust, in .NET, uh, PHP, whatever, whatever you want. Um, but uh, we'll be talking about those uh, in the next session. We'll be showing you how to write the, the application that wraps around your smart contract and interacts with your smart contract. Okay. Um, we'll also be looking at other development tools. So a great tool is Truffle, which helps you to automate um, a lot of the, the work that you want to do. It allows you to set up unit tests, which is always a, always a good idea. Um, it's, uh, I wouldn't recommend it for when you first start because it's com just command line. It doesn't give you the instant feedback that Remix does. So I think when you're initially writing your contract, it will, it's easier to write it on uh, Remix. Um, and then move on to Truffle later. But again, we will we'll talk about that next week. Um, we have a number of resources um, to help you um, write your applications. So we have our uh, community education site. Um, please go to that, have a look. We have um, workshops about writing smart contracts. We have videos uh, and step-by-step -step, uh, tutorials about that, about writing Solidity smart contracts. And then also about writing dApps. Uh, we have tutorials about um, security um, and general tutor and general introductions to, to blockchain and, and DeFi. Um, we also have a, a game we've just introduced, a capture the flag. So uh, I, hopefully I emphasize that security is very important when you're writing your contracts. Um, this game uh, lets you test out your understanding of security. Um, so it's a traditional security game of capture the flag. Um, we add new levels to this every so often. Um, so to have a go, go have a look at that, have a play at that. Um, I think it's on the Rinkerby network. So you don't going to have to pay any transaction fees to, to play it. Um, it allows you to, to test out your knowledge of um, security. So please make the most of that, that website. Um, I hope you find it useful. That's it. Um, I've given you quite a lot of information. Um, so uh, well done, I hope I haven't overloaded you. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions or if you want to ask questions later, um, yeah, please do get in touch with me. I'm happy to answer them then. Just to mention um, the next session next week, um, the third one, it will be my colleague, Tom, who is going to be, be running that. Um, he's, he's, a very, he's very good at explaining how to write decentralized apps. Um, so I'll be him running that. Um, but certainly, yeah, um, he will be able to also to answer any questions about Solidity, but if you have any in the meantime, I'm happy to answer them now, um, or if you want to email them to me, that's also fine. Shall I, uh, shall I stop sharing my screen, perhaps? Awesome. Any, any questions? Any questions? Uh, now's a great time to ask. Uh, as yeah, as Lawrence said, it'll be Tom next week, but I'm sure Tom can answer your questions as well. So yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, I just had a question. I didn't attend the first session, so maybe it's uh, specific to me, but I would just love to know uh, the big picture of how you would deploy an app from beginning to, end, to till the end, because you mentioned Solidity, and then you mentioned that's just the contract, right? Mm -hmm. Eventually, you're going to be interacting with a JavaScript library, and then you need to build a UI, and you probably need to deploy it somewhere else where it can be used. I mean, to develop a real-world application, how do you go from uh, the thing that we did today on Remix uh, to actually being uh, developing an actual app that is going to be used by somebody? Okay. So I think there was this application which was a uh, decentralized application, which was uh, probably the number one application I just saw a few weeks ago, was that uh, it rewards you points when you exercise. Because of COVID-19, people were not exercising, so it was one of those apps for just uh, being usable and downable. <laughs> and yeah. yeah. That's so um, yeah, so what I've covered today is, yes, just the, the smart contract side. So yeah, so that's the first part that you would do. So um, you, would, you would want to write your smart contract and you can use Remix to do this. Uh, you can use Remix to deploy that to the Ethereum mainnet as well. Um, obviously you'd want to do it to test nets, test nets first, um, but you can 
to use Remix to do the whole deploy process and, and, and do that. And then, yes, you need another part, which is the, the interface to that application. That is something that we will be talking about in the next session, showing you how to do that. But typically, um, there are different things you could do for that, but maybe, um, and imagine with your example, it would be something you have on your phone. So somebody will have written a, an application, probably in something like JavaScript or maybe uh, React Native, whatever language they've done. But they've written an application which then makes calls via these, the libraries I mentioned, these Web3 libraries. It makes calls from there into the blockchain um, and into your contract. So you have the, the application sitting on your phone. Um, you would have created a, a wallet. You will have the, your keys uh, on the phone. You will create the transaction on your phone and that will get passed via these libraries to the blockchain uh, and that will then interact with your contract um, and do whatever, whatever it is that your application is doing. Right, thank you so much. This okay. puts things into perspective much better. Yeah. But we will be going through that yeah, in the next session exactly how you how you write these applications and then how you interact with your contracts. I'll do that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Awesome. And uh, before we head off, uh, so we have a raffle winner for tonight, um, and that is Will in the in the participants list. Uh, so please come on down, Will, and uh, claim your prize. Okay, awesome. Um, so, Will, yeah, just drop me an email at uh, president at oxfordblockchain.co.uk um, with your Ether address, and we'll be sending 0 0.1 Ether to you fairly soon. Um, there's going to be more winnings to be had at the next event and the event after that. So there's a bit of a theme. Um, before we end, any more, any more questions for Lawrence? Okay. I think I will have a last question. Yeah, about, go ahead. <laughs> um, Right. About formal, formal verification and security, are we going to cover that uh, through this course or this series, or is that something we just um, Yeah, uh, I hadn't intended to, but I'll, okay, I'll do that in, in the last session uh, where we're looking at other technologies. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, interestingly, the, that, I mean, that's a very interesting area. Um, there's a lot of uh, research going on into that. Um, and. A lot of that was prompted by the attack that happened on the DAO and when people realized the, the potential damage that could happen if, you're, if there is a bug in your contract, then people started to look at means of formally verifying what your contract does. But I, still, I think it is still fairly early days compared to the sort of formal verification of traditional uh, languages. But yes, yeah, a very interesting area and I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll create some slides about that for session four. That sounds great. It's always good to know when uh, a new thing is starting up before it gets popular. That's when you can contribute, right? Yeah, oh, there's plenty There's plenty in this area. So, yeah. <laughs> good. Thank you. Pleasure. Uh, yeah, great question. And um, thanks again, Lawrence, for a great uh, session. I've got a few messages from people privately saying they've really enjoyed it. Um, good. So, once again, uh, if you missed anything or if you want to catch up on the first session, um, the video is available on our YouTube channel. Uh, there's also a Medium post with the slides. All of this can be found via our website at oxidblockchain.co.uk. Um, but massive thank you again to Lawrence. Uh, and I also do advise everyone to check out the educational material that xtrp.io have. So because uh, that's something I've played around with a few times and it seems like it's growing, especially the sound of uh, a game as well. That sounds quite cool. Yeah, please play. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so thanks a lot, everyone. I uh, hope to see you at the next, the next event, which will be, I think, next week, Tuesday, Tuesday and then the Tuesday, fourth yeah. one will be Wednesday. Yeah. So looking forward to seeing you there. And any other questions, just send me an email. Um, 
and we'll try and deal with them as best as we can. But yeah, thanks again. And thanks, Lawrence. Thanks a lot. And I uh, hope you all have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon. Bye-bye. No worries. Thanks. Great questions as well. Keep them coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really like the interactive session. It's nice to know. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 definitely. My first time. This is my first time uh, at the Oxford blockchain event, so this is wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A few people couldn't join in the start because um, the Zoom link was buggy, so it was the right address, but the hyperlink underneath the link was going to a different uh, the yesterday's meeting. So it's, yeah. it's really good that we're recording these. And then also anyone you know, who has access to YouTube can watch them as well. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks. And honestly, any question's a great question. So, and Lawrence loves it as well. I remember going to these a year ago and just like having my hand up the whole time because I had no clue what was going on. I, you know, I didn't even know how to run the script, so. Yeah, it's fine. It's completely fine. Uh, nice <laughs> to meet you. <laughs> I'll yeah, see you next week. Awesome. Okay. See you guys next week. See everyone next week. And uh, thanks again, Akansha. Thanks again. My pleasure. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye.